Thank you. Thank you for having me, and thank you for being here. My name is Conrad Justin, and for the last 15 years, I've been drawing. And for over the last 20 years, I've been riding a bicycle. Mm. So it would make perfectly logical sense for me to be able to draw a bicycle, right? So I never draw one, and three weeks ago, I did experiment. I challenged myself to take one minute and draw one from memory and say hello to little monstrosity. <laughs> I mean, it would just break right down. I mean, you wouldn't even be able to go one meter with it and end up on the bottom of canal with the rest of them. So it is crazy to me that I can look at something my entire life and not see it. This means that my inner, inner form of a bicycle is completely different than a real thing. And uh, this is what is this presentation is about, about how to improve our inner forms to become better artists. A little bit about myself. So I'm not small, it's just Bobo, who is really big. So this is my sister, Kat. Uh, if you ever visit Sweden, uh, keep your wits about you, because uh, Bobo is really good hunter. So I do have a little bit of traditional artistic background, drawing, painting, sculpting. And I'm a civil engineer, musician, and level designer. Not, not exactly in that order. And I've been only using Blender for four years. Prior to that, I've been using 3ds Max. But uh, with 2.8 release, I, uh, the user interface become very clear, very nice, so I moved over. And uh, you might find me. Um, walking like a lunatic, sketching sometimes, always with, within my sketchbook. And I like to write down th some things down and draw some other things. And I think this is a wonderful way for an artist to develop their inner forms. Here's another sketch uh, page from my sketchbook. And 10 years ago, I started making game environments, first for Xenotic, a very simple geometry, old engine, basically. With, uh, with plenty of limitations. Then I moved to Unreal Tournament. I could finally make bigger, open, more open environments. Uh, I did a collaboration with German Architect on, on a map for Diabotical, a fast-paced FPS game. Uh, we, and the map became official map in the game. And uh, since then, I'm making asset packs and environments for Unreal Engine 4, and now Unreal Engine 5. And here's the collaboration we're doing with uh, students from Delft, uh, really creative and uh, smart people. And we're making a game where you invert gravity to solve puzzles. It's like Portal with gravity. And um, here's m my most recent asset pack uh, for Unreal Engine 4 and 5, steampunk uh, Chinese. It's a synthesis of uh, steampunk and Chinese architecture. And uh, four years ago, I started making Blender models. Here are some of them. You can see English is not my native language. <laughs> and four years also, four years ago, I discovered Sketchmap, a platform where artists can put their 3D models and make them um, available to see real time for everyone. And it was really a game changer to me. You can zoom in, orbit around, you know, in inspect textures, inspect materials. So here are some of the scenes that I made there using simple modular set, different compositions. And here's one more photo of Bobo, because he's just too cute. Also, this is like a trap position. If you, if you reach out to, to pet him, you might say goodbye to your hand. <laughs> All right, so artistic perception of reality. I think a lot of creative process is done outside of your workshop, not in front of the screen, but when we are out there exploring, uh, discovering new things, just like Ada said uh, yesterday, nature is the best inspiration. So when we are out there and we look at things, we learn new things, we perceive reality, we take everything new we see, we put it on a specific shelf in our mind, and this shelf contains list of symbols, meanings, definitions, simplified images of that particular thing, 
and we use those, this, these shelves to communicate with each other, to, to communicate internally, and to recognize things. Speaker, audience, screen. Unfortunately, reality is very complex, and our brains simply do not have the capacity to store all the data. So we are forced to simplify. And our brains get really good at recognizing very simple patterns. So this is not a face. We might think it is a face. And the fact that we can see face in it means that our brains are really good at simplifying things and keeping those internal form, uh, forms that are not only, only simple, but also wrong. Here's a photo I took in Sweden. And here's how my brain sees it, stores it. So it's easy to recognize every, every object, but yet there is no detail. Here's another example, a painting by a Rembrandt. Uh, I saw it in the Royal Castle in Poland, and this is how I saw it. And here is how my brain stored it. And my favorite thing to draw when I'm in nature is trees. So here are two beautiful trees that I took photos of the other day. One, the one on the left, is, um, it was struck by lightning, but it's still, it's still alive, it still grows. This one, I, li I, I liked watching, I liked seeing children climb up, but uh, they, they put like this thing around so children can no longer uh, have fun. <laughs> so here's a simplified version of these trees. You can still recognize that these are in fact the same. But it's easy to recognize, it's easy to learn and communicate with this. But it is not enough for an artist. Artists, I think, have an obligation to train their inner forms so that, that they can choose whether they want to do this or something more advanced. So here's again. Like this. OK, so how do I improve my inner form of a bicycle? Let's imagine a scenario, or not just a bicycle, anything that we want to depict, really, right? So imagine a scenario. You are looking at the piece of art in front of you, and it is very complex. It's, you don't understand it. But right next to you stands an artist who made the piece. So you look at it, you don't understand it. Your category for it is not quite wide enough for you to understand the symbols, the meanings, the abstract. So you, but you have a reference, something similar that you have seen already. You look at the artist and you say, oh, yeah, this looks just like something else. You must have been inspired by something else. And the artist looks at us. Are you trying to insult me? Are you trying to undermine my creativity? I took my time to make sure that it is original artwork. That is not ju just a copy of someone else's work. No, we are just trying to communicate. So when artists realize that their category is not quite al as elaborate to, to contain information within the, and to understand the painting, artists should say, listen, they are similar, but not quite the same. Let me explain you. Let me explain the difference. And then the beautiful thing happens. There is a conversation between the viewer and the artist. The viewer expands their categories and inner forms, and the artist, who often does things subconsciously, doesn't stop to reflect why do they do something like that. It's often very intu intuitional, intuitive. They also learn about their own art. Now, yeah, so that's the process of conversation. And this is artwork by Tycho and Magnetic Anomaly, and I, I don't understand it. So I reached out to Tycho and talked to, talked to him. And so we figured it out. So now we know that we do store simplified images in our mind. And there are an obstacle when perceiving re art made by others, but also when creating our own art. And that is because when we lazily look at something, we don't actually see it. We see our inner form of it. So, so what we should do is probably discard them or learn how to improve them. You already know one of the methods, talking with the artist, conversation. And the second one is, um, well, Aristoteles has said that every thought and idea we have, we learn through the sensory experience. 
So we are, when we are out there and we fully perceive reality, when we are exploring, discovering, when we are thoughtful, analytical, and uh, we should also be positive, because if we don't learn to see beauty in things around us, we cannot create beauty ourselves. So here's an example of this. James Gurney is an amazing painter. He created Dinotopia, a world where dinosaurs and humans live together in harmony. And one of the paintings he did for, one of the illustrations he did for his book was the waterfall city. And he didn't just draw it in his workshop. He didn't just paint it there. He went out to the location when, the wa when there was a waterfall to feel the droplets of the water on his skin, to hear the roar of the waterfall, to see how the water changes color as it goes over the edge of the cliff. And he sat there and painted it. So my advice is painting is a little bit hard and it's easier to draw. So whenever you can, go out with a sketchbook or a piece of paper and pencil and draw. So there are three cool techniques that I'm using when I draw. First is squinting eyes. So I don't even have to do it, I just take off my glasses. <laughs> Same result. All the detail vanishes, the shape distribution becomes clear, and the contrast between values becomes really strong. It makes it easier to recognize good composition. So you can squint at the world, you can squint at someone, no, that's rude, sorry. <laughs> you can squint at your drawing and see if the composition still holds clarity after all the detail vanishes. Another technique is synthesizing. Every, a lot of artists does that, do that. So you walk and you draw and you pick objects around you and integrate them in your drawing, into your composition. By this is how you learn how to combine things and add, uh, put them together and add additional value. So let me explain. Let's say you, you pick up a car. There is a piece of foliage. There is a squirrel. Put them all together. And there's some human bones lying on the sidewalk. Put them all together <laughs> into drawing, and all of a sudden you have a post-apocalyptic world where human race is extinct and squirrels rule the world. So you might ask me now, why do I have to draw? It takes time. Why can't I just take a photo? Excellent question, thank you. <laughs> so the drawing, let me put it this way. Your drawing, no matter how crude and how basic, I think it is still going to be better for you than taking photo because it is how you interpret reality, how you see it. And also it is a reflection of who you are and what you feel at the moment. Every, everything you draw is expanding your visual library in your head that you always have with you, and that enables you as an artist in future projects. And also, your art is based on your style, not on the uh, and how you see the world, not how camera sees it. When we, when we take a photo, we forget everything immediately. Most of the decisions are made for us. But when, you, when we draw, we have to have make hundreds of decisions as we transfer reality onto a piece of paper. We learn about the nature of the object, but we also learn about ourselves. In photo, everything is static, everything is spinal. But in drawing, everything is dynamic. You can rearrange reality in front of you. You can pick objects, you can enhance them, you can remove them entirely if you don't like them. So here's an example. Let's say you go outside now, and in the middle of Amsterdam, you see a mountain, a beautiful mountain. So you, you take it, right? You pick it up and multiply it, put it in the background. There is a windmill used for pumping water. Put it in the golden ratio. There's a bicycle obstructing view. Throw it into canal. <laughs> With your imagination, you're rearranging reality in front of you, and that is just the tip of the iceberg. If we go further down, ah, yeah, th this is the final composition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So, who, who wants this? <laughs> We can stretch reality if we want. Let's say we have a building. We can draw a, one thing with features of a completely different thing. Building goes straight, but the tree goes like this. 
why don't we draw a building that goes like this? Although you shouldn't probably live in the fifth floor of the building. It would be dangerous to go out for, uh, to, to the balcony. If we invert it, we can put small windows and store small doorways onto the tree. Someone could live there, some small creature. The hell with it. Let's make an entire town on top of the wooden log. All right. Uh, this is Blender conference, so I should probably talk a little bit about Blender. <laughs> so I'm going to uh, talk about photorealistic rendering, something that Andrew Price talked about yesterday, so I won't go into detail. Photorealistic goals in uh, photorealistic rendering in general is basically an attempt to make a render look, look like indistinguishable from a photo. So goals for a photorealistic renderer are filmic color management, I think it's by default, PBR textures that can be obtained through various websites, or uh, you can make them yourself if you take photos of different surfaces, high poly sculpts, quite difficult skill, and lighting simulation, cycles. So what is amazing to me is that all these goals in photorealistic art are tools, and many more, in NPR, non-photorealistic art, or, uh, or called artistic rendering which is basically any other type of render than photorealistic rendering. So let me show you the practical uh, example use of what I just talked about. So here, in near the place I live, there is like this beautiful gate. I saw it and I liked it. But it, I didn't exactly know what I liked about it. So I did speed sketching. I forgot to mention this before, and there was a third technique, speed sketching. So speed sketching is basically when you look at something, you don't know why you like it, but you like it, you draw it as fast as you can. And your mind subconsciously focuses on the best parts. So you look at your drawing, oh, so this is why I like it. Very useful. You, you're capturing essence of what you want to depict. So I, this is the first uh, photo, and this is final version in night and day, day, cycle, day cycle. I'm using synthesizing as well. I see a chair, I pick it up. I see like a nice foliage in between the cracks and crevices of the concrete, I pick them up as well. And uh, so here is a speed sketch that I made there. And these are more, uh, I take more time to, to add more detail, also uh, uh, outside. And this is sketches, these are sketches that I do at the workshop, when I need to figure out uh, details, like uh, how the ornaments are, are going to look like, how is the chair going to look like from side, or um, the lantern. The first step is going to be a block out, very basic shapes, very basic primitives. The, the, the whole, the opening is done with Boolean. And the tree is made with curves that taper. Then I make sculpts. I'm using them to render, to bake the textures, into, to create stylized textures, not photorealistic textures. Then I add the details. I use hair emitter to scatter around the foliage. Then I, I do position camera take a screenshot, put it into Krita, paint over it, because there are some cool brushes there, and I project it back onto the 3D, top, 3D geometry in Blender. The other side. And this is final version of the diffuse, but something is missing. This could be a work of art, I suppose, but I'm not quite satisfied. So the magical part comes here, add painting light. So I add HDRI, 35 lights, spotlights, area lights, you know, directional lights, point lights, and the emissive foliage. And for the day cycle, I do have a diffuser in the back, 28 lights, HDRI, and negative lights. You can have a negative lights. So if you use the slider, you don't, you don't get to, to the negative, you get to zero. But if you type in minus 50, you're actually subtracting the value and the hue, which is amazing. So next step is baking lighting. I bake all that information into the textures. I have two versions now, daytime and nighttime. And uh, yeah, this is what I saw, and this is how I interpreted it. One last thing before I end is uh, Fluffy. Here's a, this is a photorealistic Fluffy, Snow Owl. Although infinitely cute, Fluffy will look always the same on every single photo. But in stylized art, in NPR art, we're not limited by it. So we have a much wider range of tools at our disposal to convey emotion and to convey style. 
So this is a trap of photorealistic uh, rendering. If we're not careful, we might lose that emotion. We might lose that style. OK, let me summarize what I just talked about. First thing is to know that everyone, including you, categorizes and stores simplified images that are also quite wrong. Our task is to improve those images by talking with the artist and experiencing things, being thoughtful, respectful, and positive. When we draw or paint or we just visualize, we should do like speed sketching, synthesizing, experimenting, reimagining reality. And I encourage you to use photorealistic rendering, but as your tool, not, not as your final goal. Okay. Thank you for having me.